Starting June the 1st, Ontario electricity customers will see, on average, a 25% reduction in their bills. It's not that the cost of power has fallen, but that the provincial Liberals say mistakes have made electricity prices unfair to this generation. And so yesterday, Premier Kathleen Wynne unveiled the so-called Fair Hydro Plan. Joining us now for a look at what's powering that proposal and whether it can deliver. Bob Delaney, the Liberal MPP for Mississauga Streetsville and Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Energy. Todd Smith, he's the PC MPP for Prince Edward Hastings, his party's energy critic, and he comes to us via Skype from Belleville. And Peter Tabbins is here, the MPP for Toronto Danforth and the energy critic for the NDP. And it's good to have you three here with us, both in studio and on the line in parts beyond. Let's start by um, playing a little snippet of Kathleen Wynne's news conference yesterday, and then we'll come back and chat. Mr. Director, please. Last September, I committed to reducing electricity bills by 8% across the board, equivalent to the provincial portion of the HST. But it hasn't been enough. It's made too small a dent in people's bills. And for that reason, we're taking more action. We are tripling the size of the cut we're making to people's hydro bills, from 8% to an average of 25%. Electricity rates in Ontario will come down significantly. They're going to stay down, and everyone will benefit. Okay, Bob, let's get into this. What is the rationale for putting the costs of powering this system more on the backs of taxpayers as opposed to ratepayers? Steve, uh, electricity is a commodity whose price is rising and rising quickly everywhere in the world. And uh, almost uniquely, about a dozen years ago, Ontario actually spent some money on the system, a system that had been neglected for more than three decades. So when you put $50 billion worth of capital expenses on the system, then as those bills come due, you're going to start to see it on your electricity bills. Now, again, almost uniquely in the world, because Canada uh, has some of the world's lowest electricity prices, those costs have been paid entirely by the ratepayer, where in a lot of other jurisdictions and countries, they're shared between the rate base and the tax base. So what this proposal does is two principal things. It takes those parts of electricity assistance, such as the Ontario Electricity Support Program, which is a social program, and moves that onto the tax base. It takes some of the amortization of some of the assets that the province bought and says, instead of paying it all out over a short period of time, pay it all out over a longer period of time, which I would liken to uh, a couple buying a house in the GTA anywhere and uh, saying, okay, my first objective is to be able to afford a house and live in it, my second objective is to be able to afford the payments. So in a mortgage, you'll often stretch those payments out over a period of time where you think you can minimize your interest and yet own the home and pay it down. So that's what uh, the province aimed to do. It's the equivalent of um, looking at it this way. We bought tomorrow's electricity assets. We paid for them with yesterday's money and financed it over their lifetime at interest rates of nearly zero. Okay, let's get some feedback to what the Liberal plan is. Uh, let's go to the official opposition critic first. Todd Smith, your view on what the Liberals have advanced. Uh, I'm not sure how Bob can say that with a straight face. Clearly, this is costing future generations billions of dollars. What the government announced yesterday was a desperate plan by a desperate premier and a desperate government. Um, that really is not going to curb the rising cost of electricity in Ontario. All it's doing is spreading it out over a longer period of time. Yesterday, the Liberals didn't do what needed to be done, and that was stopped the increasing cost of generation that they've put on the system, billions and billions of dollars in sole source contracts for... All right, we'll see if we can get that Skype feed fixed. Uh, meantime, let's go to Peter Tabbins. Yesterday's announcement, your reaction yeah. to that? We're, we're in a situation, Steve, where this government, the Liberals, proposed to borrow tens of billions of dollars to pay down the hydro bills that people have in advance of an election. There's no mortgage here. We're not buying anything. We're paying rent. We're borrowing money to pay rent, frankly. It is going to be very expensive for us in the long run. It doesn't deal with the fundamental structural problems in the system. Privatization that was initiated by the Conservatives and carried on by the Liberals have meant that we're paying profit on hydro bills that we didn't do 20 years, 20 years ago. And frankly, we have an inflexible system. Right now, we're producing too much power in Ontario. We sell about $2 billion a year at a deep discount to what it costs us to actually generate it. And we absorb those costs. There's no hint from the Liberals at all that they're dealing with those structural issues. 
what they're talking about is borrowing money, not changing the system. And if you don't change the system, stop the privatization of Hydro One, restore public ownership, we're going to continue to see these prices soar. And frankly, we may get past the next election, but those underlying dynamics are going to reassert themselves and drive up the costs. Okay, let's get into some of these criticisms here. First of all, the I wanted to leave the politics till later, but Todd Smith brought it up already. A desperate move by a desperate government looking to somehow uh, curry favor with the electorate 15 months in advance of an election. You want to respond to that? Oh, complete rubbish. Um, this uh, program is aimed at uh, ensuring that Ontario retains the ability to generate electricity. I mean, uh, the Conservatives missed the point. It's not about green electricity versus polluting electricity or even cheap electricity as opposed to expensive electricity. It's about having electricity as opposed to not having electricity. These are choices that every jurisdiction in the world is going to have to make or is making right now. And in Ontario's case, uh, we are running well ahead of the curve. We've turned off the one quarter of our electricity that used to be generated by coal. Ontario no longer generates electricity from coal. Uh, we've refurbished our nuclear reactors, giving us 40 years of affordable, predictable, clean, green, safe electricity. We've added a component of renewables that enable the electricity system to meet its daily peaks and valleys. And uh, we've put $50 billion worth of investment into generation and transmission, essentially spending in the past money that most other jurisdictions are going to have to spend in the future. So uh, with regard to what Mr. Tabin said... Well, hang e on to that. Let each me go back to Tom. Well, just one last hang point. On. One last point. Mm -hmm. Each and every year, this province makes a profit on the sale of electricity of between a quarter and a third of a billion dollars. That's not true. That's not true. That's okay. not true. Todd Smith, you Simply go first. Uh, where to begin? Where to begin? Apparently, Bob uh, forgot that Kathleen Wynne actually apologized for the Liberals' mistakes that they had made on the energy file back in November at the Liberal Convention. Uh, she said in a teary-eyed moment that uh, they made mistakes that ended up costing Ontarians uh, the ability to heat their homes, and many of them were shut off over the last year, 60,000 of them were shut off of the electricity because they couldn't afford it. He apparently also forgot that uh, just last week, Glenn Tebow, who's the Minister of Energy, apologized at a speech in Ottawa with the Economic Club where he said that the Green Energy Act uh, located um, generation facilities in parts of the province that were suboptimal, meaning they were located far away from where the power is actually needed. Most of that in the GTHA in and around the Toronto area where uh, things are happening and the power is needed, uh, not in rural Ontario. He also said that uh, they created community conflict, which in my riding in Prince Edward Hastings is happening uh, all the time and continues to happen right across the province. And he also said uh, they were unaffordable contracts that drove up the cost of electricity. So, uh, you know, you can't speak out of both sides of your mouth uh, saying that you made mistakes and then you didn't. Okay, let's hear Peter Tabbins' concern well, with the last comment. Well, the last comment, saying you make a profit when you buy something for a dollar and send a, sell it for 20 cents, that's not a profit, Crazy. not by anyone's definition. We lose money on those exports. We we claw back a little bit of it, but frankly, we're generating far more power than we need. In fact, there are times when we pay New York State and others to take power that we can't consume in Ontario. This is a system that is a very strange Rube Goldberg machine. The parts are not working properly. You need to talk about dealing with the structure, not so, just borrowing a ton of money to pay bills. So f finish the story, mm -hmm. and that is that uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, New York, uh, Illinois, uh, and Minnesota also um, uh, transfer power at a loss or at cost to Ontario, and if either of my colleagues would uh, take the time to visit the independent electricity system operator, they would explain to them that this kind of interchange across the border happens all the time, minute by minute. The first thing they do in the morning is look at the weather and see who's going to uh, need power, and if somebody's uh, lines go down or a generating station is out, they transfer power. The, the point is, at the end of the year, when everybody totals up, what did you buy, what did you sell, how much did you get? Who makes uh, a surplus? And the answer is Ontario makes a surplus annually of between a quarter right. and a third of a billion. What about the other? Not what about? Hang on one second. What about the other comments though that were made? Which is which? Todd Smith is right. Premier Wynne did acknowledge her culpability in decisions having been made. She also at the press conference yesterday said, "My predecessor, whom she did not name, but if recollection serves, it was Dalton McGuinty, also made mistakes in decision making that put additional cost burdens on this generation as well." That is all accurate, isn't it? 
as you look at uh, decisions made in the past with perfect 2020 hindsight, you can draw that conclusion. But if you start with what they knew at the time that they made the decision, those decisions were predicated in the early part of the last decade on projections that were made in the late 1990s on the PC Watch, projections that were so wholly and completely inadequate that it led the province to say, we need a better system, which, was, which gave rise to the long-term energy plan system, of which we're now doing the third. So at the time many of those decisions were made, 03, 04, 05, they were made with the best possible information. Was there, um, to your question, no. was there... They ignored uh, the experts. Was there um, an overbuild of renewable energy? In retrospect, yes. yes. Okay, let me uh, put this... Actually, stand by one second. Actually, there's an overbuild of gas-fired energy. St but stand anyway. by one second. I, uh, the, the, the Conservatives did tweet out a bunch of things yesterday about this plan, and I want to just read a couple of them now. Uh, Sheldon, if you could bring these up. The first tweet from the PC party said, full cost of fix Kathleen Wynne's hydro mess, 172 billion over 30 years. Don't be fooled, we'll pay for this for generations. There was a second one that said, tackle the actual problem? Nope, burden future generations with more debt, higher taxes, yep. Future generations didn't donate $1.3 million. But then under that, in the graphic, it says, Premier Wynne just took out 42 billion in interest to band-aid her green energy hydro mess. She signs the next round of bad green energy contracts tomorrow. Seriously, that tomorrow meaning today. Now, Todd Smith, I need to ask you about that because today is the last day for applications to the green energy feed-in tariff program, but no contracts are being signed today. So some people are going to wonder whether you're misdirecting people with that tweet. Uh, well, the FIT5 program actually is continuing today. Today was the last phase for contractors uh, to pull out of participating in the FIT5 program. So all of the companies that uh, have put contracts on the grid already are getting another opportunity today to continue to participate in the process of putting renewable energy projects on the grid. Okay, so but they're not signing any new contracts. So the tweet saying she signs the next round of bad energy contracts tomorrow is inaccurate, right? Uh, yeah, the, the, okay, I'll say that's inaccurate, but the projects are moving ahead through the system and they, they will be signed. They, they will be signed. I mean, they're, they're moving ahead with the process, meaning that uh, FIT5 is continuing. I just wanted to add one other thing to what uh, Bob was saying. And, 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 and the thing is, when this, when this deal came about in the first place, the Green Energy Act, the uh, experts at the time were advising the government, the ministry's own experts at the Ontario Power Authority were advising the government not to go down this road. The three of you were all at Queen's Park when John Tory, who was leader of the PC party at the time the Green Energy Act was introduced, commissioned a report as well that showed that electricity prices were going to rise potentially $1,200 a year in some cases for residential consumers. We've seen that happen and we've seen massive, massive increases to our manufacturers in the industry industrial sector are job creators who, by the way, aren't getting any relief uh, from what was announced yesterday by the Premier. No, that's true. That's more on the, uh, the homeowner as opposed to the industrial. But let me bring this quote up here and then I'll get Peter Tavins to comment on that. This is from the Chatham Daily News just the other day, uh, quoting Andrea Horvath. Bringing more renewables to the grid is something we thought was an important thing to do, Horvath said. Where the government went wrong was in the implementation. They kick-started the green energy economy and they kicked the stuffing out of the people of Ontario. So the question is, does the province, in your view, need to cancel and or renegotiate some of these existing green energy contracts to get the prices lower? I, I don't think they're actually going to have much impact on the price, frankly. Uh, if you look at the cost of renewables on our hydro bill, it's about 12% of our hydro bill. Bills have gone up 100% in the last decade. So if we'd had no green energy at all, we would have seen an almost 90% increase in our bills. The fundamental problem we have here in Ontario privatization of the hydro system, which frankly we warned against back in 2003. The Conservatives started it. It meant that we've had these profits built into our bills that we didn't have in the past. And it's also meant, Steve, that when we need to reshape the system, we're constrained by these private contracts, which force us to guarantee 20 years of profits. We went through this in the whole gas plant inquiry. We found out that cancelling those plants meant we were on the hook for many years of profits. That's why it cost a billion dollars to get out of those contracts. If you're going to deal with a problem in Ontario, you have to stop the privatization of Hydro One. You've got to reverse it. You've got to restore public ownership. Something, frankly, the Liberals said in the 2003 election, but then just simply abandoned immediately okay. after the election. That's your plan, which you unveiled earlier this week, which we'll get to in just a moment. I, I do want to ask one more question of Bob, though, as it relates to 
the program the Liberals are advancing. There are a number of new and or enhanced rate subsidy programs that the Premier announced yesterday and taken as a package. That's about two and a half billion dollars over a three-year period. There is the cancellation of the HST on the electricity bills. That's another billion dollars. Can you just give us a sense about what the average saving to the average homeowner will be as a result of all of these measures? Roughly 25 percent. It uh, will vary uh, depending on your use, um, but most homeowners should see about a 25 percent uh, reduction in their bills. The and as I said earlier, mm -hmm. this, this comes from taking those parts of electricity support that are really social programs and saying, should a social program rest on the hydro bill or should it rest on the tax bill? No, I get that, but some, you know, some are going to argue that bill. that's fine. You're taking, you, I mean, you've got to pay it somehow. So whether right. it's the ratepayer who pays today or the taxpayer who pays today and tomorrow, some are going to ask if it's fair to make, you know, our children and grandchildren pay the extra tab on this so we can have cheaper electricity today. Well, that's not the point. The point is if you're well, going to, if you're going to build um, a facility such as a refurbished nuclear plant, um, a gas plant, uh, a windmill that has a lifespan of about 40 years, are you going to uh, pay it down and amortize it over 10 or 15 or 20 years? Why not amortize it over its actual life so that those who are going to enjoy the benefits of the electricity throughout that 40 years are also going to pay that amortized 40-year cost. The, the which critics would, be, would argue the reason you don't do that is because you're going to pay whack more in interest payments than you otherwise would. Exactly. The, the, yeah. This would make the same sense as saying, well, why don't you pay off your mortgage in five years? And the answer is, I couldn't afford it but I intend to live in the house for the next 35 or 40 years, so why not pay it down over the, the period of time that I'm actually living in the house, or in this case, actually using the generating facilities, the substations, and the transmission lines. Todd, what's wrong with that argument? Uh, because a lot of those uh, generators that we're talking about won't be around and in use in 30 years' time. Some of them have already yes, been in the ground. Speaking, No, they will not. Absolutely not. The solar voltaic will not be around. Who knows what technology is going to bring along over the next 30 years, Steve? And uh, there are many of those generators that will not be in use. Why would we continue to use these projects that are uh, paying 80 cents a kilowatt hour uh, to produce and then we're, we're, we're getting much uh, a much smaller amount back in return it just doesn't make any sense I'm not it's, sure anything's going at 80 cents a kilowatt hour anymore I think those deals oh, were made years no. ago but yeah, exactly but those yeah, projects are still on the grid. have been renegotiated they're, down they're, renegotiated. they're still on the grid yeah, all right th let that's me the one thing that's uh, the one thing that the Liberals didn't do yesterday was try and address the actual problem, and that's the cost of generation, which makes up 65% of the cost in the electricity system. Oh, nonsense. 60% of our electricity comes from our nuclear reactors. 25% comes from uh, hydroelectric said, dams. And uh, about 10% uh, uh, comes from gas plants that are used only at exactly. peak times. Generation. And somewhere generation. between 5 and 10%, depending upon the season, will come from renewable electricity. And, that's all generation, uh, that's and what that's, I said, 65%. And that's all dispatchable, which means you turn it on when you need it, which means you're only paying for it while it's on, and you turn it off when you don't need okay. it. Okay, gentlemen, jumping in here, because the, the NDP did unveil a very detailed plan also earlier in the week, yeah. and I want to give Peter Tabins a chance to speak to that. Your plan starts with basically reversing the partial privatization of Hydro One, that's the wires company, right. the, the distribution company. Uh, we've sold off, I guess, about 30% of that Correct. so far, and your plan would, I'm not sure if repatriate is the right well, word or buy whatever back. it is, buy back those shares and put the whole company back in public hands. Correct. What's the value of doing that? Well, two values. The first is that that company generates something like $700 million to $800 million in profit a year. As we privatize it, we lose that revenue, and it's something the financial accountability officer raised when he assessed it. He said the sale would damage our general revenue as we get into the 2020s. So we want to have the money back in public hands. But the other thing is, those private investors are going to want to crank up their return on that particular company. So the pressure for increased rates in the future is going to be very substantial. Well, as the pressure for spending billions to reacquire those shares would be pretty intense right now, wouldn't it? Well, it will be over about four, four to eight year period, that's right. But frankly, the pressure on ratepayers to pay higher hydro bills is something that people are going to be very mindful of as this privatization increases. That has to end, Steve. And we've seen what's happened at the generation side. 60% of generation in Ontario is privately owned, and the pressure upward is relentless. I want to get Bob to comment on that because every poll I've seen suggests 
the partial privatization of Hydro One is not popular, and people did prefer the company when it was 100% owned by the people of Ontario. So why not go that route? Well, first of all, uh, the NDP's proposal would see $5 billion of taxpayers' money spent uh, renationalizing a company that frankly should be regulated in the same place that our banks are, that our telecommunications companies are, and that our transportation companies are. I think are. their plan says 4.1 billion at the, at the top end. Which is almost certainly an underestimate, but whether it's four or five, that's money that we should be spending on improving transit in the GTA. It's money we should be spending uh, working on infrastructure in the GTA. And the rationale for privatizing it is to uh, as if you were taking out a second mortgage on your house to uh, build an addition to it to say we're going to sell some of our assets while we retain ironclad control over them in order to acquire other assets. You continue to own a portfolio of assets and in this case instead of it being occasionally scrutinized uh, in the legislature um, it's scrutinized on an ongoing basis by the Ontario Securities Commission which has teeth and um, as I said, this is the place that an entity like Hydro One should be uh, regulated and where it should get capital because this allows Hydro One to be able to expand the scale and scope of its operations, to be able to raise both debt and equity capital. This is where they should okay. be. Let me get Todd Smith on this. Uh, Todd Smith, your party is also against the partial privatization of Hydro One, but I'm not sure whether the solution the NDP has gone for is something you would sign on to. Is it? It depends on if the Liberals continue to sell off the remaining 30% that they're planning to sell. They've already sold 30%. They want to sell 60%. There's a th certain threshold. It's actually 45% that uh, once it goes past that point and if the Liberals continue down this road, uh, securities uh, regulation says that you can't buy it back. Um, so what we're calling for the government to do is just stop <clears throat> what they're doing and stop the continued sale of shares at Hydro One. 30% enough is enough. Stop right there. And what would you do then, in, in, if you were the government of Ontario today, as you may be in 15 months, who knows, what would your different approach be? Uh, well, you know what, uh, we wouldn't buy it back because uh, once the government says it's going to buy back uh, the shares of the company, suddenly it's going to cost a heck of a lot more than I think what the NDP are talking about. If we get it back with still 70% uh, ownership, we would be uh, by far the majority shareholder and have control at the table, uh, something that the Liberals um, are, are letting slip away. And so uh, we would find efficiencies within Hydro One. We've seen examples of what has happened under the Liberal watch, uh, the current CEO and president with the compensation of $4 million a year, while his counterparts in other provinces across the country are making in the neighbourhood of $450,000 in salary. So it's out of whack. We've seen executive compensation go crazy under the Liberal government, and we have to find efficiencies within those companies. Okay, I've got literally a minute left, and Bob, I want to give it to you because... Uh, I've never seen a situation like we've been in, in the last few years where when you survey people, they say their number one concern is the high cost of electricity. It's almost always health care, education, the economy, jobs, whatever. It's never been hydro prices, but they are now. Uh, we've talked mostly policy here today, but I want to ask you one last political question. Are the changes introduced yesterday enough to, slop, to stop rather the popularity slide that your government has undergone over the last many months because of electricity prices? Well, our discussion in caucus is, are we doing the right thing in the right way at the right time for the right reasons? And our challenge here is, uh, uh, are the people of Ontario going to be able to have re affordable, reliable, clean electricity That's not what now I'm asking you. and I'm for asking the years you if to you're, come? I'm asking you if you, can, if you think this will stop the slide in popularity that your party's undergone because of this issue. You know, I believe that uh, public opinion is eventually going to judge you on the basis of whether or not you've done the right thing. And um, when we look at the alternatives to it, the Conservatives have no plan. I don't agree with the NDP's plan. Um, I think uh, when Ontarians have a chance to compare in an election whose plan does exactly what, at least we have a plan, and you know exactly where the province is going. You can decide whether you like it or dislike it, and I'm not going to prejudge the decision of the electorate. But um, as uh, a member of the government, I look at what the province has done and $50 billion worth of investment means that in the province of Ontario, 
we're going to have secure, affordable, reliable electricity throughout the rest of my life and that of your children. Steve. Gentlemen, that is our time, and I appreciate all three of you participating in this debate, even as Todd Smith shakes his head because he didn't like that last answer. No, uh, not at all. <laughs> Bob Delaney is the Liberal MPP for Mississauga Streetsville. Todd Smith is the PC MPP for Prince Edward Hastings. Peter Tabins is the NDP member for Toronto Danforth. Thanks to the three of you for coming on TVO and having this debate tonight. Thank Thanks, you, Steve. Steve. Thanks, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.